morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all joining. My name is Irfan Nuruddin. I'm the director of the South Asia Center at the Atlantic Council and professor in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. On behalf of my colleagues, Ambassador Amayade, director of the Africa Center, and Randy Bell, director of the Global Energy Center, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this roundtable discussion on African and South Asian perspectives on the Leaders Summit on Climate. Over the last uh, week, Washington has been abuzz with the Biden administration's initiative to bring together 40 world leaders to discuss new commitments to fighting the scourge of climate change. President Biden led with an announcement that the United States would commit to reducing its greenhouse emissions by almost 50% by 2050, including vast uh, reductions in fossil fuel usage within the United States. But part of that was really an effort to galvanize global support at the highest level of leaders to make commitments on behalf of their countries, recognizing that the only solution to climate change is one that is shared and global. As part of those conversations over the last week uh, here in Washington, much focus has been on whether or not the commitments made are enough, whether they're adequate to meet the need of the, mo of the, the challenge of the moment, and whether or not the political will within the developed world exists for President Biden and his counterparts to actually be able to deliver on the vast promises been made. These challenges are amplified in the developing world, in countries across South Asia, across the African continent, and other parts of the world that have, by and large, been minor contributors to the current climate change challenge, yet bear a disproportionate burden of the risks and uh, challenges posed by, challenge, by climate change, by rising heat levels, by rising sea levels, by increased pollution that increasingly hurt the livelihoods and lives of their citizens. And yet, in spite of all of those challenges, the need, maybe for exactly those same reasons, to for these countries to lead on a climate change solution for the 21st century couldn't be greater because, as I said, they are the ones who bear the brunt of the of climate change. But the tools that they have access to, arguably, are much fewer than those that exist in the West. Uh, the industrial know-how, the fiscal constraints, and often the policy constraints are far uh, more binding on developing countries than they are on their developed counterparts. So this morning, we seek to engage this conversation on the Leader Summit on Climate Change to assess what was announced, how to think about what, it was, what was announced, but really to think about the implications of these announcements for the developing world, and in particular for the countries of South Asia and Africa. To do so, we have assembled a wonderful panel. Uh, Ms. Ayana Adam is a, a former director of the private sector equity at the Green Climate Fund and currently senior director and CEO of AFC Capital. Dr. Mohamed Ali is non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute and also an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Studies here in Washington, DC. And joining us from Delhi, Mr. Jairam Ramesh, who served as chief negotiator for India at the Copenhagen Climate Change Summit, has served in the Indian cabinet, including as Minister for Rural Development, among other portfolios, and currently serves as member of parliament uh, in the Rajya Sabha. To guide these uh, eminent scholars and thinkers through this conversation, we are very honored to have Ms. Aubrey Ruby, non-resident senior fellow at the Africa Center, founder and CEO of the Africa Expert Network, AXN Network, uh, among other titles. Aubrey, I leave you in this panel in your hands. Thank you so much for this morning. Thank you, Irfan. It's such a pleasure to be partnering with the South Asia Center on this important conversation. And it's really my honor to kind of lead us in this uh, discussion. Uh, I want those of you who are listening to be participating. And so we are opening the Q&A function on this uh, webinar and please use it. I will in, in, incorporate and weave in the questions as we go. So I encourage you to be active. Um, it's really my pleasure to, to, to really begin to, to reflect on what happened last week at the summit. 
by first turning to Jairam. You know, as former chief negotiator for India at Copenhagen, I would love to hear what you thought of the summit. Was it meaningful? Did it move the ball forward, especially for uh, emerging markets and developing countries? Well, first of all, I should say that the re-entry of the United States uh, into the uh, Paris Agreement uh, is, is welcome. Uh, it shouldn't have withdrawn in the first place, but better late than never, it's come back. Uh, and we, we can expect a full engagement, an active engagement, President Biden, uh, former Secretary of State John Kerry, Special Envoy. So I think the US will remain engaged. Uh, however, it's not very clear uh, as to uh, what is the mix of legislative and executive commitments as far as the US is concerned. But that's a matter of detail, uh, you know, which I'm sure will get clarified later. Uh, I, you know, uh, from India's perspective, uh, really, uh, the things have changed dramatically. Uh, and, um, you know, the entire country today is, is talking of COVID. Now, we can talk about the relation between climate and COVID. Uh, but this is not the time, this is not the occasion uh, that, you know, people are going to listen to it. So right now, when we are battling a pandemic, uh, this is hardly the time to be talking about increasing the level of ambition, uh, you know, by um, the time the Glasgow COP comes. However, having said that, let me say that uh, the Paris Agreement uh, needs to be implemented both in its letter and spirit. So before we go around, uh, you know, talking of level of ambition, what the ambition we had committed to at Paris needs to be implemented. We need to have an architecture that monitors uh, the implementation of those commitments. And there are many parts of that agreement which have to be operationalized and given, you know, practical shape. Uh, and when you is, talk about those commitments, you're talking about the hundred billion dollars a year that was pledged in no, part I, from. Uh, you know, that hundred billion dollar thing will keep continuing. You know, it's it's an issue that's been on the table since uh, uh, Hillary Clinton announced it at Copenhagen. Uh, you know, twelve years ago. No, but I'm talking about you know the uh, most importantly the architecture for monitoring, the the architecture for accountability, the architecture for reporting. Uh, how the carbon trading mechanism is going to work uh, and the credibility of the commitments uh, that we have made. I mean, for example, if I were to take India as an example, uh, the commitments that we have made on uh, renewable energy, uh, we will exceed. The commitments we have made on emissions intensity coming down, we will exceed. But the commitments we have made on forests, for example, uh, are, are uh, you know, completely unrealistic. Now, you know, when we talk of net zero, what does net zero mean? Uh, you know, in, in, in simple English, it means that you're taking out uh, as much carbon as you're putting in. Uh, and so how are we going to take out that carbon? Forests is one way of taking out that carbon. And I can certainly tell you that the that the commitments that we have made in Paris uh, in, in so far as carbon sequestration by forests is concerned is not going to be achieved by 2030. See, making targets for 2050 is very easy because none of us are going to be around. But really, it's 2030 that matters and the roadmap from now till 2030. And once yeah. having made those commitments, we must hold ourselves accountable. So, you know, this level of ambition business, I am not, uh, you know, they, I, I don't want to be over evangelical at this moment of time. What we have promised, we should deliver. I mean, that's, yes. I think, the first an overriding priority. The, the focus on the architecture is an important one. And the question of whether countries are in the room that should be in the room. And I want to turn to uh, Dr. Ali from, to talk about were, the, were all the right countries in the room uh, during the summit last week? And you see some on the sidelines that should have been there. Well, as far as Pakistan goes, um, I mean, it, it, it was quite um, concerning uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, so, I mean, it's it's been like the amongst the top five countries um, uh, hit by climate change. I mean, it's, it's emission levels are uh, less than 1% of the global total, which is per se not necessarily an indication of pa Pakistan, uh, you know, having... Um, 
uh, ha had a sterling environmental record, but perhaps also because of the size of its economy. But nonetheless, you know, it, it hasn't been a major emitter and it has been hit really hard. I mean, in 2010, they, there were these floods uh, where some, something like 20 million people and their livelihoods were affected, crops washed away, etc. Uh, there's been recurrent drought, um, uh, seawater intrusion, etc. So Pakistan felt quite uh, ignored, you know, particularly given the current geopolitical realities where um, uh, uh, the former Senator Kerry and, and now the, the climate uh, advisor to the president uh, went to Bangladesh, um, you know, which is again super vulnerable, uh, went to India and uh, Bhutan was uh, invited amongst those 40 countries and Pakistan wasn't. And then, you know, the, the sort of the speculation mill got going and, 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 and you know, citing um, uh, American displeasure uh, in, you know, in, in uh, Afghanistan coming out and, and, and indication of Pakistan being sidelined and having a very myopic approach. So politics, of course, does, does come in. And, uh, you know, at the last moment, there was some kind of a turnaround and Pakistan did get invited, but only to the adaptive. Uh, adaptation, resilience, adapt, uh, adaptation side panel. So, uh, so you know that um, being uh, what it may, um, Pakistan has. I mean, in in, in June actually, it's going to be um, it's going to be involved with the World Environment Day, and uh, in, you know the the Imran Khan government has. I mean, for as far as forest cover goes, and it's not the only thing. Right, and it's uh, it's it's not um, you know entirely uh, uncontested, but I mean he's been at it when he was uh, you know when they had the government in one of the provinces in the northern province of KP Khyber Pakhtunwa, um, they they uh, planted uh, the campaign was to plant a billion trees. Subsequently, they planted um, you know I mean now the current camp ongoing campaign is uh, the the ten billion tree tsunami and has also put in place some other measures but it you know it what one really needs to do is have and you know th this is for the international community that's now trying to address these issues that there are also regional uh, you know uh, constraints and uh, and complaints and um, i mean dod of all you know of all government entities here in the us several years ago had had referred to climate as a threat multiplier yeah absolutely it's a threat across the board uh, in terms of in exacerbating security issues, uh, causing conflict over, over scarce resources. I want to continue on the same theme about the architecture and kind of where countries fit in this just transition by turning to Ayan to talk about the African participation in the Leaders Summit. Uh, we know that Africa was represented by five countries. And that in the summit, um, South African President Ramaphosa had talked about the need to have a just transition and a need for um, ensuring that more resources are allocated to, to the efforts. Um, so would love to hear your thoughts on the effectiveness of the summit from, from an African perspective. Okay. Thank you very much, Audrey. I'm very honored to be in this panel. Uh, thank you so much. I know that you have interviewed many at the AFC before, specifically our CEO and president. So um, I, I do believe the summit was success in the sense that I think, um, as uh, Sri Jairam Ramesh said, having U.S. back, I think, on the table, it is a huge success. And along with that is also appointing at the DFCU as the a critical um, um, instrument for U.S. financing to come to climate change. So I would like to, um, first of all, briefly highlight the, the, the issues of climate change for Africa and your question on the financial architecture and how that could work, how it's working and how it could work better. Because I think what is needed for my point of view is two things, lots of finance and second, the role of the private sector. These two have been missing elements in the whole climate discussion. And I think these are the most important factor going forward. The first one is that when we look at the African context, and this is generalization, but the reality is one fact is that we're less than 4% contributor 
to the, uh, the em to emissions in general of all kind. So that makes us the 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 party that receives the impact of the high rise in global temperature, the high rise in sea levels, the um, significant temperature rises in some places in Africa over 40 degrees to point that people sometimes die of drought and as well as um, high temperature. We also are not haven't captured up to, to up to today, I think, is the impact it's having not just on the ecosystem, but the cost of even building infrastructure. You know that today to build a port, first you gotta rise it at a certain level. You have to have the, the erratic rains. Category five has become a norm. This was used to happen every, God knows, 100 years. Today it's happening day on day. Case in point, look at Mozambique. They have lost 55,000 hectares of agricultural land. There's been a damage of over seven to eight billion, directly 2.2 billion in its infrastructure, but even more than that in the after effects in the communities. There's been yeah, lives these are countries that, that have to build infrastructure, right? So while Absolutely. you have a hundred billion dollar gap, your infrastructure funding gap, you yeah. have to, it costs more money to build this infrastructure. So for sure exactly. the effects are there. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about why we would need carbon offset markets so that you could raise financing. So this is the point about um, how to get more additional financing. And what are your thoughts on that? And that's very important because Africa has 18% of world forests. Our population is still dispersed. We are blessed with a very large continent that we can have these forests. But let's not forget there are people living in these forests. For them not to cut it, we have to give them incentives that enable them to conserve these forests because the 18% of land cover forest is in Africa. So if you can, but we're not getting, as my CEO has said many times in your forums, we are not getting the right value for our resources. This land cover is currently priced in, in the red price market at a very low price. This is the offset. This is the carbon sinks that will enable the world to achieve a cooling or the 1.5 to the, okay, people have left two, but we're not even in the trajectory to get to two. So you need that 18% cover with the right simplified methods for us to, to trade so that the people there should live a middle-class life who are guarding these forests, so that's one. Second, we had a home to all the resources. Uh, Audrey, you have spoken to Samaila on this. We have cobalt, we have lithium, we have nickel, close to half of world reserves. These are gonna be very important for the electrical transition. But then the cost of, we don't, we don't get the value that we should be getting as a continent. So to me, Africa's contribution is for us to get the resilient money that we need to, re, to, to, to properly build our infrastructure. Second is to have these lands to be properly traded in the, in, the, in, the, in the carbon market. We need to simplify. I think Latin America has benefited. Africa has yet to benefit. There is not a single carbon project of scale that's happened in the African continent. And the pricing is so low. And then third, we need to monetize our uh, significant resources and get the right pricing because we will solve the climate change problem even though we haven't caused it but we need the finance, we need significant amount of it, and we need to unlock yeah, the staying on, stay, staying on this topic of, of carbon offsets markets, we know that 90% of the demand will be in developed countries, but 90% of supply will come from developing. Jairam, what's the view of kind of the carbon markets in, in India? And do you see that as a major need for, uh, for progressing in terms of financing green growth? You know, I have been very deeply suspicious of carbon markets. And I made this position very clear at Copenhagen uh, in 2009 and Cancun in 2010. Uh, and I have remained deeply suspicious of this. In fact, even the original clean development mechanism, the CDM, which was set up, if you remember, as part of the Kyoto Protocol. I mean, there were a lot of holes in the manner in which uh, the CDM got implemented. Uh, there was, a, and the, I'm, you know, I'm not even talking about the moral arguments involved, 
Uh, I'm talking of the pure economic uh, arguments involved in, in the operation of these trading mechanisms and markets. So I, for one, uh, have been extraordinarily skeptical uh, about the value of markets. And to think that the markets are going to be generating the billions of dollars that are going to be required uh, in countries of Africa, in the small island states, uh, and in vulnerable countries like Bangladesh and Pakistan, leave India and China aside. You know, these are big economies, these are big emitters. And my position always has been that India and China can take care of their financing and technology needs on their own. But here we're talking of Africa, we're talking of the small island states, uh, and we're talking of countries like Maldives and Bangladesh and even Pakistan uh, in that category. I mean, so, you know, to, to expect that the money for uh, resilience, for building resilience uh, and for uh, building adaptation capacity is going to come from markets in my view, is very, very grossly exaggerated. It has so do you see the, the importance to be bilateral uh, transfers rather than the markets? Well, the markets may have a niche role to play, uh, you know, provided the markets function in a transparent manner, in a robust manner, uh, and you're not shifting mitigation responsibilities, you know, uh, uh, from one part of the world to the other. So I think, you know, one has to be a little careful about these markets. Uh, I'm not a market atheist, but I'm a market agnostic, you know, when it comes to meeting the financing requirements uh, of these countries that are desperately in need of finance, particularly for adaptation. And that is why I come back uh, to, the, uh, to the position that I have consistently held, that it's the responsibility of the major emitters uh, to, to make sure that their mitigation, uh, you know, is kept under strict limits. Uh, and in this, I include the China, I include the United States, I include the European Union, I include Russia, and certainly I include India. Uh, so, you know, we cannot run away from our mitigation responsibilities. And I think this, uh, the uh, you know, I talked about the architecture a little while earlier. Uh, in fact, this whole COP architecture, in my view, is a bogus architecture. Remember, we are having COP26 in Glasgow. For 26 years, we have been trying to arrive uh, uh, and, uh, you know, flesh out the details. And we meet in COP25 to decide to meet in COP26. We will meet in COP26 to decide to meet in COP27. And this COP is a cop out, you know. So in, <laughs> and in so, Jairam, if you were put in charge of fixing it, what would you change? I would, I would change. This multilateral system has run its course. You have to move away from this. You will not have an agreement till everybody is on board. You know, take the top 20 emitters of the country, of the world. Take the top 10 emitters of the world and, you know, hold them to their mitigation requirements. And in this, I include my own country. You know, I think we need to be doing much more uh, to, you know, to reduce our, you know, uh, our trajectory of emissions so over the next five to 10 years. So, I so would we use the platform of G G20 then? Yeah, I would, you know, I there is a major emitters forum, there is a G20. See, there is a parallel I'd like to draw. You know, we have the World Trade Organization, we have the WTO. The WTO is a multilateral agreement. But in that multilateral agreement, we have plurilateral windows. The difference is that in a plurilateral window, not all countries are, are members. Only the mem only countries which want to be members become members of that agreement. Now, India is a member of the WTO, but it is not part of the WTO agreement on procurement, uh, which is a plurilateral agreement. So I think we need a plurilateral agreement on mitigation uh, because the mitigation responsibility uh, of India uh, is, is you know far greater than the mitigation responsibility of Bangladesh or Maldives or Pakistan or Bhutan. Uh, you know, in the South Asian context, for example. So, I, you know, we, we have to think creatively uh, if we are going to reach these objectives. My, my uh, problem uh, is we're focusing too much on 2050. We're focusing too much on net zero. The roadmap, the trajectory, the milestones in the process. Yeah. I, I, am here. I see you nodding. What do you, what, how do you respond to uh, Jairam's approach? 
Uh, no, I do agree with uh, Sri Jairam Ramesh's approach. I think this has been the position of most developing countries. However, I think we need to be practical. Uh, the reality is um, a significant amount of work in Africa is done by the private sector and we and they are suffering the consequences. So I think we do need to get uh, some resilience money to maybe offset the incremental costs of making infrastructure more resilient to be better. But I still think Africa has managed to uh, waive the aid dependency on building its infrastructure. So, so, so I, I think I'm coming from, there is a role for the private sector to play. Frankly speaking, even if the, the, the top countries give us the 100 billion that is required to support climate change, that's not enough. I think the needs are in the trillions. So we need some of that 100 billion to basically be a catalyst in moving the trillions that are sitting in the global financial markets. So that's my take on that. We do need to de-risk the funding that should be available. And that is what uh, has somewhat worked for Africa. Um, in, yeah, and one of the things that's my I've been, one of the things I've been concerned is that um, you know, we're seeing trillions being pledged by private sector players. I think we're going to see a surge of global finance going for, for green investments. My worry is that African countries get left behind because of the definitions uh, embedded in that type of investing. And so if you say that it has to be carbon neutral, for example, or things that don't work in an environment that is a lot of countries that are more or less not industrialized or less yeah. industrial than they were in 1980. So it's not the Chinese model of just you know, saying that they're not going to increase coal consumption. You need actual uh, green growth when it comes to African markets. So how can we ensure that you know all the new Blackstone money, let alone the money sitting in, in North American pension funds, uh, actually meet some of the green infrastructure needs of African uh, countries? What are your okay. thoughts on that, Ayan? Yeah, so I think we need to broaden green to include uh, uh, resilience in gray. Also, we need to look at the blue oceans. A huge part of Africa is ecosystem-based. People are living off fisheries. So I think we need to create new asset classes. And I think that's why I have come actually to AFC, is we do need to create a new asset class in resilient infrastructure, which should attract this money. Because in Africa today, if you look at it, financial sector has been well developed. Um, uh, many African countries, because of the fact that we have a power deficit, have actually gone renewable, Egypt, South Africa, and others, without it being a, a mandate. It was just a cheaper source of financing. But where is the deficit in Africa's growth? That is infrastructure and manufacturing for us to capture the next wave. We need to have these sectors grow because this is what's gonna make the, uh, that's gonna employ, because it's about employment. It is about livelihood. So for these two should qualify for climate investment. So my call is that we need to look at Africa as a resilient building asset class that is attracted to this. So if we can defray the incremental costs of making this infrastructure resilient, it should qualify for capital markets. And we need to create not the green bond, but the resilient label in African uh, uh, market, because that's where the deals are in the context of Africa. And Dr. Ali, are you seeing models of that in, in South, South Asia? Uh, you mentioned about water earlier when we spoke. And, and um, so what are your thoughts on Ayan's kind of call for resilient infrastructure? So uh, in terms of financial instruments, I mean, Pakistan is uh, thinking about a, a debt for uh, nature bond floating that where, I mean, it, it could go to creditors. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I think I, I, I should perhaps put on my development anthropologist hat on, right? And I, I do feel uh, also some uh, skepticism about the use of market mechanisms entirely, because, you know, uh, with that, there's also this tendency of, uh, of business as usual. And you know, then we get into these earlier precedents, which we know produce very skewed and problematic outcomes, um, right? So uh, I mean, because then we get into terms of trade, 
I mean, you know, and there's a whole history of the resource curse. So already we've started seeing, um, uh, I, I think Miss uh, Miss Adam kind, kind of alluded to this earlier, uh, where, you know, I mean, you have a lot of uh, the minerals needed for renewables in Africa. We've already seen sort of cobalt mining, I mean, the brutality with which that is occurring, right? So, uh, so we have on the one hand, we're pursuing these ecological uh, solutions, be it car batteries, or even, uh, you know, using food crops for, uh, for biofuel. And then uh, alongside that, you start seeing food insecurity, right? And uh, one doesn't want this kind of ecological uh, now sort of, you know, uh, highly skewed, um, you know, so the burden of, uh, of preservation and mitigation is again being faced by those same people who are getting, you know, pennies while, I mean, we have, you know, while we have business going on as usual. Yeah. So, so I think that's quite problematic, but, you know, but alongside that, I mean, it's not to say that the national governments of uh, developing countries uh, are particularly enlightened, right? And, and I mean, and, and this also goes now for for the new players on the block. So I mean, with China and its ideas of uh, economic growth, right? I mean, be it the CPEC project or the larger BRI, and yeah. you know, there uh, are also issues there, right? Like with the infrastructure development, with the energy projects. But I mean, would you like me to speak to the water issue uh, in particular? Well, I think we'll come back to that. Uh, we had one question about you just mentioned national governments sometimes not being that enlightened. I do want to, to dig down and especially Jairam in the India case um, where it's a very messy federal democracy and the same as, say, in Nigeria. You know, should there be engagement at the subnational level, uh, state and province level, say, for example, in the African context in Nigeria, the city of Lagos is, is surrounded by water. It's, it's totally dependent on sea levels and many ways that the Lagos state could be more engaged and move faster on certain green growth uh, trajectory than, say, others. And I'm sure India has similar stories. What are your what's your thinking on how, um, you know, sub subnational uh, government aid levels can be involved in this in this discussion? Well, certainly adaptation uh, and building climate resilience involves the involvement uh, of local governments. Uh, and in India, we have seen uh, that local governments uh, have been actually active and I mean, quite proactive in this stage, in this way. But, you know, I, well, for India, the big challenge is mitigation. It's not so much adaptation. Mm -hmm. You know, in Africa, in Bangladesh, uh, in Pakistan, in Maldives, the challenge is adaptation. But in India, the challenge is mitigation. And for us, the single biggest problem, uh, yeah, the, the single most, uh, you know, crucial conundrum is how far we can get away, how quickly we can get away from a dependence on coal. Uh, because ultimately, you know, our, our greenhouse gas emissions are going to come largely because of the energy sector. Uh, and um, we can do all the renewables, uh, you know, we promise and we've promised 450 gigawatts, uh, you know, to President Biden in this joint statement that was issued between the Prime Minister of India and President Biden. Uh, it mentions a figure of 450 gigawatts, uh, you know, of renewable capacity by the year 2030. And that's an eminently doable uh, target because the prices of solar power uh, have been coming down dramatically. When I was minister, it was 15 rupees a unit. Today, yeah. it is 2 rupees a unit, you know. Uh, but the question is that um, even with all this uh, uh, renewable capacity, which today's energy storage technology, you still require baseload coal, you require baseload nuclear. Uh, and, you know, nuclear has to play a very important role. Unfortunately, uh, the nuclear option is a red drag uh, to most environmentalists, you know, most environmentalists um, who, you know, who are arguing for climate change, um, you know, would, would, would say no to the nuclear option. Even Angela Merkel uh, has said to the no, no to the nuclear option. But you need either nuclear or coal for a base load capacity till we have some revolution uh, you know, yeah. here, here is a mobile phone, uh, which was unthinkable 15 years ago. 
maybe we will have some energy storage device like this by the year 2030 uh, and that will completely change uh, the discourse but till such a time as energy storage revolution takes place we need we need that base load capacity for generating electricity uh, which comes either from coal or from nuclear and it's a cruel choice that countries like india have to make but we have to make it and we have to have the courage to make it now rather than make commitments for the year 2050. And do you think China serves a model on what they are talking well, about? Well, you know, the, 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 you know, the Chinese model, China followed the U.S. model. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, the U.S. accounted for 25 percent of world emissions and uh, China accounted for about 12 to 15 percent. Today, the re proportion is reversed. China accounts for 27 percent and the U.S. accounts for only about 12 percent. The U.S. model has been extraordinarily contagious across the world. It's a resource intensive, energy intensive model of economic growth, which is simply unsustainable. And if India were to embark on that same model, uh, you know, which is basically grow now, pay later, uh, it's, it, it's it's not, it's just simply not going to be sustainable. Yep. Well, so uh, speaking on this growth, you, you know, what your model for growth is, one of our questions um, is, uh, do smaller South Asian and African countries see tension between growth and being green? You know, do a lot of leaders really accept that green growth is the way forward? Or do they still feel like we should grow at whatever cost? and you know and just deal with it later because that's what everyone else did i mean thinking about the african context where 1 million young people turn 18 every month and we need to create 450 million jobs in 20 years it seems like the imperative is grow at all costs uh i and i don't know if you see that tension or are do you really feel like there's a growing consensus that we need a different growth model that's greener so I think um, for, before I answer that, and I want to also take on from the last point uh, that uh, uh, Shri Jairam Ramesh said, the reality is we do have oil, and for us that's still a very viable base load, right? So, and you know, if you take our oil from one of the largest countries in Africa, that is Nigeria, which has had very turbulent economic times in the last few months, in the last few years, I would say, it is not a fair growth. Remember, we are not emitters. So I think for us is how do we grow? And the, I think the notion green need to be uh, properly implemented. So there's nothing wrong with Lagos. It's a very green city. But what's the problem with Lagos is that the sea is rising, right? And we need to protect. The, a Lagos will disappear if the ocean continues to rise. Second, we have erratic rains. I've never seen before. And uh, even 15 years ago, when I used to come to Lagos and today, I'm telling you, these rains come and they sit on the roads and the roads then decapitate. You could see holes coming on the roads. These are not the normal rains that the African countries have been used to. So I think we do need to speak about how do we bring a resilient city? How do we make Lagos into a resilient city? That would not mean green. It means how do we put in the right drainage system in all the roads in, in Lagos? How do we protect, how do we put better sea uh, rises in the city? How do we build resilience in the buildings, in the offices? So we need to really, uh, we need to move the definition of resilience. Even in, in Nigeria, which is an oil producing country, the challenge is resilience building. So there is a uh, um, financing. We need this financing to come to African institutions that understand the scenario so that we can properly allocate the needs to where they should be. So I think I wanna just um, bring that back. Yes, Africa is about growth. We do have the parameters to grow, but it is important for us to also have the capital markets because we are dependent on them, financial flows to support that growth. And the word greening is not 100% in line with the reality of Africa. We, If we kept our forests, we could actually burn as much fossil fuel and still not contribute to emissions. So, so I think we need to think that. I think Africa is being a good citizen, we world citizen. We can contribute to, to basically 
providing other countries the means to meet their net zero goal. But we are not in the in the danger of uh, how do I say it, blowing those targets. Yeah. So this is it, it's a very important narrative for us to correct. And we don't want to be penalized by the capital markets if they're only one green. But green, what do you mean by green? I've only suffered the impact of climate change. I don't need to green. You need to green and I can help you green, but give me the money to build my infrastructure. Give me the money to industrialize. Give yeah. me the money to grow my economy. This is the narrative of Africa that we need to fight for. What I mean, that strengthens what Jairam was saying about really the, the difference between mitigators and those that need to mitigate and those that need adaptation and resilience and that big divide in many ways. Um, Dr. Ali, did that speak to the, the situation in Pakistan as well in terms of is there a tension between growing and just growing at all costs and, you know, or a consensus around green growth? Well, I mean, the, the prime minister has, uh, you know, committed to 60 percent clean energy by 2030, um, you know, and uh, simultaneously, you know, with, with the w one of the biggest sort of forestation uh, drives at present, but the forest cover had gone down precariously low, uh, you know, one of the lowest in the region, something like 5 percent. So there's, there's a long way to go to see actual fruition. Uh, of uh, uh, you know uh, of both these goals, but you know if you look at the role of of China um, and and the CPEC projects, and you look at the energy blend, uh, you know within the country, I mean there is some solar and wind uh, investment, but there's been also investment in coal, so fossil fuels, uh, you know earlier use of oil and um, and now now coal and hydro. I mean in my mind, uh, you know I mean. Yes, there's, you know, one needs practicality and one's not entirely averse to nuclear. I mean, if you have it, then at least use it for energy, um, you know, rather, rather than, <laughs> you know, what, what it's uh, currently being uh, used for. But, uh, but even, even hydro is not the so best solution, right? When, when one looks at um, ecological problems, seawater intrusion, Right. I mean, those are problems that Pakistan is facing. And, uh, you know, while there's been some talk of trying to convert uh, existing coal to liquid or gas, uh, right there, I mean, there is a lot of work to be done in that regard. And, um, you know, when it comes to hydro, the problem, again, in many of these countries which are upper riparian and lower riparian, I mean, with the Kabul River, for instance, I mean, landlocked Afghanistan has no water treaties with uh, Pakistan, with any of the Central Asian states. And it had one with Iran uh, back in the 1970s that was never really operationalized because of those four decades of, um, you know, of, of extreme conflict in the country. And now there's tension again because of some damming on the Helmand. Now, when it comes to the Kabul River, which is simultaneously upper and lower riparian when it comes to Pakistan, because it's an S shape. And although there's just on a tributary uh, of the Kabul River, India is build damming, helping, uh, you know, uh, build um, Afghanistan a dam. It's, it's raising all these concerns, right? I mean, the World Bank did a treaty with uh with pakistan and india in 1960 right which is kind of stood the test of time despite all the turbulence between the two countries uh, yet i mean that was not a very environmental treaty right i mean it was like it just bifurcated gave a large trunk to pakistan because pakistan largely well, yeah, depends maybe on the, some of the solutions you know we're seeing the same situation in the horn of africa around the gird dam situation with egypt and ethiopia um, you know, some of the solution we've seen is is market driven, if I would, if I will, like off grid solutions. Uh, I've seen because as as uh, as Jaram rightly pointed, the price of solar options have gone down, has gone down so dramatically that it becomes competitive. And I'm very eager to see those kind of um, solutions to, for example, countries infrastructure problems we've you know can you leapfrog the giant centralized solutions um and as these things become more economic 
And instead of fighting over large hydros, which who knows if even the rain uh, is still going to be there, you know, can we focus on river, small river hydros and um, and decentralized solutions? Ayan, I see you shaking your head. I mean, yeah. can you so absolutely, some absolutely, of these absolutely. And I think you've seen this in East Africa in some places. And I really want to touch on the issue of the dam and the hydro. So we had actually this problem in Zambia, as you know. Zambia was 100% hydro before they went solar. And in Zambia, what happened was that uh, in the drought season, people were fighting for water and power. And, and the, so it was like, you didn't have water and you needed to use the water for power. So we, we saw where it's, it's a mitigation story, it's a greening story, but then it was a mild adaptation. People didn't have water. So, I mean, politically, I'm gonna leave aside the issue of Egypt and Ethiopia, but one has to think. Uh, that is a water starved region. So do you want to put all the water in energy? Um, and and you need to you you need to think about this. Let's put it that way. And you know, it, and the Nile is not just Ethiopia. You have Ethiopia, Somalia, uh, parts of uh, all the way to you know um, Uganda. I mean, there are many countries that are dependent on the Nile. So the reality is that becomes a geopolitical issue. Actually, it becomes a very big problem for the countries that also need the water. Uh, it's as I said, water star region. That water is used for agriculture and so on and so forth. So without getting into the politics of that, I think one has to look at the solutions. Whether gr the greening solution is maladaptation, as you would say. So it's very important to look at that. And so hydro has proven that it can cause issues if it's not properly done, and in, in, in especially in a water starved region, right? So I'm going to step away from that and say that most of Africa is not densely populated. So the revolution, I mean, we uh, somebody lifted the phone. We used to have landlines. We moved away from that. And now some households in Africa don't have a phone. There's no phone. So my thing is that in most rural Africa, the distributed solution, which is private sector led, is the probably the solution. They don't need all that much power. They just need a a, a, a solar rooftops, uh, 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 either a box. Uh, there are companies like B Box that are operating in East Africa, which actually you have a little box that lights your house, lights your refrigerator, lights your TV, and that's it. It's a unit you buy, your service, and it is. You don't need to construct a massive power station. Second, from a resilience point of view, and we've seen that in small island developing states, sometimes putting all the center power in one grid is actually not resilient because when there is a hurricane and that breaks, you're in the dark. So having distributed even power systems in mini grids is also a good solution from a resilience point of view. So absolutely, we could leapfrog technology and supply most parts of rural Africa to distributed solutions. I definitely believe that is a viable option. Maybe only densely populated areas require the large grid or mini grids that are connected. Yeah, so you know, I am sensitive at time and we've had such a robust conversation. I wanna do a last kind of round robin on, um, you know, we've had a question on your predictions for Glasgow. Um, I, I know Jairam already what you you kind of think, but I wanna hear um, what you think will happen at Glasgow. Um, something that you would, again, your most controversial view of what's going on right now. What do you think everyone is missing and they should get right? And then lastly, one thing that makes you optimistic. So I'll start with you, uh, Jairam. Uh, what do you I think, think will happen, happen think at Glasgow? Glasgow? I think Glasgow will be virtual, number one. Uh, I can't see a physical uh, COP happening in, uh, happening in Glasgow in November or December, uh, unless there is a dramatic turnaround in the COVID situation. Number two, I don't see countries uh, increasing their level of ambition over and above what has already been uh, uh, agreed to. And number three, what is inevitable in Glasgow is that uh, the venue for COP27 will be announced. Uh, you know, so uh, I I don't see I don't see any dramatic uh, uh, breakthroughs uh, in giving operational content to, to the gaps in the Paris Agreement uh, and in having this architecture. Uh, you see, the whole architecture of Paris was that the nationally determined contributions will be bottom up, 
In other words, every country will take upon itself responsibility it is comfortable with. And the transparency and monitoring and accountability architecture would be top down. This would be a, this is a hybrid approach. Uh, but we have now got only the nationally determined contributions, but we don't have a system for holding the countries accountable, uh, either domestically or internationally, uh, for what they have committed uh, as part of the Paris Agreement. So, you know, I think this we will meander along. And frankly, as far as India is concerned right now, climate is uh, is not, you know, the overriding issue. It's, it's really dealing with the COVID pandemic. And I think this is not going to be a matter of days or weeks. Uh, it's going to be months and months. Uh, and uh, the remainder of the year is going to be uh, dealt, uh, we're going to be dealing. And Pakistan is almost, um, you know, virtually in the same boat as far as, uh, the COVID-19 situation is concerned. So uh, I think we should keep the debate going. Uh, but frankly, uh, I'm realistic as to what we can accomplish in Glasgow. And Jairam, what do you think everyone's missing in the climate discussion and dialogue? What do you think was kind of totally uh, overlooked in the in the summit last week? No, many of these issues have been raised. They have been on the agenda. It's not as if they have not been raised. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, uh, we've proceeded by fits and starts. Uh, and, you know, just I want to respond to one of the points that was made earlier, you know, on, on this, uh, you know, the, the solar option uh, is a dramatic uh, transformation in the world in the last few years. And the one country which has no business being a world leader in solar because it doesn't see the sun six months in a year is Germany. But Germany has made use of the solar uh, transformation in to completely re-architecture its electricity generation and distribution system. Uh, and I think that's what uh, countries like India and the United States and you know big countries need to do. Distributed, uh, you know, generation, distributed, uh, you know, distribution and transmission instead of replacing a centralized fossil fuel facility with a centralized solar or a centralized uh, utility level wind facility, we're going to be, you know, repeating the problem. So I think, you know, the solar transformation, we should not look at it as simply a solar device, but it's an opportunity for reconfiguring and re-architecturing the way we have looked at electricity generation and distribution. And if we do what Germany has done, uh, I think uh, we would be uh, we would be better off and we would certainly be making a difference as far as global warming is concerned. And it's certainly a source of optimism. So Dr. Ali, I'll turn to you. What do you think will happen in Glasgow and what do you think has been missing in the conversation? And, and lastly, a source of optimism. Well, I mean, what's been missing is uh, the money, perhaps. I mean, so despite American commitments and people are talking about like $800 billion needed, so it's going to be a small pot and it's there's going to be competition. And I think what then countries need to do is they need to articulate, uh, you know, uh, feasible ideas which have also geostrategic value in this context. So here I have, you know, the, the need in South Asia, for instance, I mean, we talk all eyes are on Afghanistan right now, but water is going to become an issue. Right. And where, where is uh, where are the water sharing uh, conversations vis-a-vis uh, -vis Pakistan and Afghanistan? Otherwise, it's another contention like the Durand line. Similarly, the opportunities of environmental <coughs> diplomacy, I mean, already air pollution, there's like finger pointing on both sides. Where is that cooperation? Right. Um, and CPEC greening. And I, I think that really if, if CPEC could be greened, Right. I mean, gone are the days of, uh, you know, uh, Nixon going, uh, you know, um, uh, Nixon and Kissinger uh, rapprochement through Pakistan. But I mean, if there's going to be environmental collaboration in that spectrum of extreme competition, right, CPEC provides an opportunity there. And I think I think it's an opportunity with broader implications vis-a-vis -vis BRI and, and what's happening, you know, in, in, also in the Middle East and then in Africa. So if those kinds of opportunities can be availed uh, where every it can be a win-win potentially for all sides, I mean, that would be encouraging. Turning to you, Ayan, for the last words, what do you think uh, the, the African countries can get in Glasgow? 
and um, you know what really you think is missing from the conversation and what gives you hope during these challenging times? So I'm actually particularly happy that the U.S. is back on the table. Um, and I think there's an opportunity for the U.S. and Africa to collaborate and for, for significant amount of the U.S. climate commitment coming to Africa for resilience building and adaptation. The reason why I say this, two thirds of more than 60, almost 70 percent of least developed countries are in Africa. We also have a significant amount of the uh, vulnerable, the entire India Ocean Rim, all the countries that are impacted by climate change in that area are there. So I, I, we would like to see a simplified method for us to get the climate money. It is a lot of bureaucracy and, and, and uh, red tape. A significant amount of data is required for us to get that money. I would like to see a, a, a quick, expeditious flow of the climate money and also just a little bit more climate justice when it comes to Africa. And uh, what's giving you a source of hope these days? Me? Yeah. I think um, what gives me a source of hope is the role of the private sector. Um, and I think if we can reshuffle a lot of that money with uh, some de-risking required, um, I believe actually we will get that money faster. Uh, but I know I'm a minority in the panel, but I still believe in the role of the private sector in solving uh, significant problems um, with the right incentives. Well, listen, it's a pleasure uh, having met and spoken to all of you today. I think this discussion was robust and engaging. And now I'll, I'll hand it back over to, to Irfan. Thank you, uh, Aubrey. Uh, if it was robust and engaging, and it was, it is entirely to your credit as a moderator for this wonderful conversation. My deepest thanks to Sayan Atum, Dr. Mohamed Ali, and Mr. Jairam Ramesh, not for making the time to join us this morning, but for bringing their expert uh, perspectives honestly, sincerely, uh, provocatively to this conversation. These are important questions that can only be tackled by serious uh, and honest conversations about the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. On behalf of my colleagues at the Global Energy Center, the Africa Center, and the South Asia Center, allow me to thank our colleagues on the AV team, Mr. Roger Morales and Ms. Candice Jackson, as well as uh, the South Asia Center team, in particular Ms. Damola Aluko and Ms. Kavri Sarkar, without whose work this event would not have been possible. This is an incredibly difficult moment in India, uh, in South Asia, around the world. Uh, we pray that your families and friends are safe, and we hope that um, you have a wonderful day. We look forward to engaging you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Irfan. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.